You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Before we begin, I want to say feedback from you, our listeners, is part of the process. So tweet us at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Today, Todd Vorenkamp and I are joined on the show by Vincent LaFerre. Of the many photographers we meet and greet here at B&H, few can lay claim to having won a Pulitzer Prize for their still work and three filmmaking awards at the Con Lions International Advertising Festival. Vincent has earned his place among the best photographers working today. His client list includes Apple, Nike, Canon, National Geographic, Vanity Fair, and Sports Illustrated. Today, however, Vincent is here to discuss air. Not the stuff we breathe, but a beautiful new book containing magnificent aerial photographs of some of the world's greatest cities. I've seen many of these images on high-res monitors, but quite honestly, looking at these very same pictures impeccably reproduced in this large format book is both amazing and humbling. Vincent, welcome to B&H Photography Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We want to get into talking about this book, but before we do, can I ask you a bit about your background? Where are you raised? Where are you from? And how did you get into the racket of photography? Sure. First of all, thanks very much for having me, guys. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, I got into this when I was 15 years old. Uh, my dad is a photographer, um, and I had absolutely no interest in photography back then. But uh, one day I just said to myself, it's, it's really silly that, you know, my dad's a pro and I don't even know how to use a camera. So did I, he encourage you? Or oh, you just... absolutely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he did everything he could to have me do something else. You know, I'm, I come, uh, I, was, I grew up in France and came here when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And to him, I was living the American dream. You know, I was going to uh, good high school and I got into North, Northwestern journalism school. And he basically said, you know, Go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, just do not do, you know, this career, which is, as we all know, a difficult career, always has been, um, you know, to make a living. And um, he did every, he sent me to every black and white C41, E6 printing lab that he could on summer vacation to try to just, you know, steal that passion for photography. And the problem was it just <laughs> had the opposite effect. And after four or five years, he finally just gave in and said, all right. I guess this is what you're doing. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Yeah. What about commercial work? Did you did you start off doing you started off doing editorials? Yeah. Correct? For for most of for the mo the most part of my uh, quote unquote budding career, um, I started when I was 16. Was published in uh, a few big French magazines, including Perry Match. Mm -hmm. uh, as a freelancer, uh, I came to New York and I worked for an agency called Gamma Liaison. And uh, would go out and shoot Keith uh, Keith Richards at concert, the the Democratic National Convention here in New York. You know, I was the youngest kid there, but you know, I was he brought me up with a very technical mind, um, and I was very prolific in terms of you know having sharp and well exposed images or relatively well framed. I had a pretty big background in in, in the arts, from life drawing to painting, you know, and whether it was watercolor, oil, acrylic, you name it. So I had a pretty good foundation um, in terms of uh, composition, if you will. So I, I, you know, I also have a story I like to share, which was that uh, my dad's a very easygoing guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to sound terrible in a second. But um, good, keep going. <laughs> I, would give, I would give him my 30 best slides of the month, uh, every month. Uh, and, and granted, keep in mind, I would see him, you know, for one or two months or three months of the year because he still lived in France and in Paris, worked at a magazine called Premier Magazine, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a movie magazine. And I would give him my, my you know, my blood, sweat and tears, my 30 slides of the month and, uh, and a stack of 30. He said, give me your 30 best slides of the month and I'll, I'll tell you what I think. And he would stack 10 on the left and 20 on the right. And he would slowly open his uh, desk drawer and pull out a pair of scissors and... <laughs> Right through the 20 that were out of focus or poorly exposed. And I, you know, he sounds like a terrible, tyrannical guy, and he's actually the nicest guy in the world. But he was making a point, which I think still, you know, lingers within me, which was uh, his point was unless the images are well exposed and uh, in focus, I don't want to see them. And granted, this was before the autofocus days. But uh, it taught me um, 
<laughs> it damaged me, but <laughs> it also <laughs> it taught me how important um, having a technically viable image was, and more importantly, how you have to learn your basics first before you can, you know, break all those rules and, and do fun stuff. You have to understand how to create a, a solid image to communicate what you're trying to to, to do. So he. He didn't want you to do photography, but he had you studying watercolor and drawing and things like that as, as a viable career choice. Lucrative fallbacks. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, I just did that on my own. I mean, I was a very, first of all, as a bilingual kid, right, language was not my first thing, you know. Uh, so I, I gravitated towards the arts. You know, I was in the, in the choir. I, I was in theater. I was you know, doing all those different arts. Um, you know, I was definitely not like a football jockey. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Did you have any kind of a goal when you started getting into photography as far as the kind of pictures? Because your background is really varied. I mean, you, you were with the New York Times. You photographed war zones. You photographed Katrina. You've been in a lot of different areas, including now a lot of advertising, which is an offshoot, something that grew out from your editorial. But when you started out, did you have a certain picture in your head, for lack of better words, about where you saw yourself going? I got into film schools and I got into journalism school, and I had a very big decision to make. Um, and ultimately, at the age of, I guess, 18, I decided that I wanted to cover real life before covering, you know, fictitious, you know, the film world. And I was very much an idealist. Uh, I really, you know, I grew up in the end of the heyday of journalism, if you will. Uh, it just isn't what it used to be today anymore. I go to the journalism schools, journalism schools, and unfortunately, it's just not quite the same ethos. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was really about, you know, accuracy and honor and ethics and credibility yes. and never sharing your opinion and never, ever, ever asking someone to do something in your photograph. You know, there was an honor in that. And, you know... I guess, you know, in a way that a, a police officer, you know, likes to do the, you know, fight the good fight and catch the criminals and the bad guys. And, you know, everyone has the judges like to serve, you know, to, to execute justice. I think for journalists, that was really something special um, without having to be a cop or, you know, in, in those type of, of, of areas. It was my way to, to serve, if you will. There, you know, it really did feel like a public service back then. And uh, it was a huge honor. The years of the New York Times for me, I think it was almost eight years, were some of the very best formative years of my life because I got to witness, as you said, um, everything from the Olympics, the World Series, Super Bowls, um, to uh, the White House, to, you know, elections, you name it. I mean, I, I really covered uh, everything all the way down to wars and Katrina, um, got to climb the top of the Empire State Building on the needle. So when you get those chances, you know, it, even at that point, like we were taught not to talk about ourselves. You know, it was when you turn in a photo, so people would say, well, tell me about yourself. And it was like, it's not about me. It's about the picture. Let's talk about the picture. It was kind of this old school way of thinking that I miss, you know, where uh, today it's all about the star and, you know, the Twitter followers and who are you and, um, you know, I feel like I'm getting old. I'm 41 now. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I wish we could go back to those days where it was about the work. Interesting point. Really interesting point. What kind of assignments impacted you the most out of all the things and places you'd photographed? I mean, first of all, I, had to, I got to live one of my dreams, which was when I was 15, 16, I would sneak into the U.S. Open and shoot the tennis matches. And uh, eventually got to shoot like on the number one spot on the court as a New York Times photographer. So for that kind of nice loop, it kind of happened for mm -hmm. me. And the irony is the last images I shot at the U.S. Open were back up in the stands with a tilt shift lens for the New York Times magazine. I went full circle literally going back up to the stands where, the, you know, everybody else was as opposed to being in the prime position. Uh, two big things happened in my career. 9-11 um, happened and I was... Uh, out of pocket, I was on vacation in France to see my dad. And uh, I was not a war photographer. You know, if you wanted to send someone to um, a convention or to the Olympics, I was your guy. You know, cause I would more often than not be able to really focus and get those pictures that, that were defining of, of that event. When bullets fly, I hit the ground and I stay down. I have no interest in covering conflict. But did you come back? To photograph 9-11? Uh, you couldn't. That was the thing. So ah, I was stuck right. in you, Paris. There was no air. That's right. There was no, air, no, no flights other than to Pakistan. So <laughs> <laughs> I got this call at 3 o'clock in the morning where they basically said, well. Um, they being the New York Times. The New York Times okay. saying, um, hey, how do you think, what do you think about going off to Pakistan? And I was like, 
uh, I mean, it was such a tough time I, and I, I just did it. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I, I quickly learned to uh, work with a photographer named Patrick Aventurier mm-hmm. who worked at Gamma, who I'd known for, with my father from the from when I was in my teens. And I said, listen, I work for the New York Times. We have resources. We have a car. We have fixers. Yet I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going I'm to get killed. And you have, you know, 10 wars under your belt. And you're not a competitor. You're not competing with the New York Times. Why don't we pair up? And that was an immediate pairing that helped us survive. And although we had some pretty hairy things happen, you know, guns to the head, AK-47s, all that fun stuff. There was one point where we got surrounded by uh, about 40 guys, you know, 20 or 30, which had AK-47s. We were the last of a 13-car convoy. And the the rule is never be the last car. And uh, I remember pulling out my phone and realizing first there was no signal. B, if there were, and I could get George W. on the on the line of the White House, there were no Delta forces coming, and I've never felt more alone. You realize, How old were you now? Twenty six. Right? Yeah, that, that's um, that's a lot to deal with. I, I oh, think yeah. at any stage, but particularly uh, you it know, early on, it takes its toll. It takes its toll, especially when they ask you to put on a burqa and go into Afghanistan, and you're like, well, at some point I'm gonna have to pull the burqa off to pull the camera out. The reporter can take mental notes. This is not a good idea. How how long were you there? Three months, three very long months. I came back a changed person for sure. Yeah. And um, then I did the second Gulf War, which is a bit different. I went through an entire uh, 10-day training with former SAS guys where they teach you how to put your entrails back. Uh, they teach you how to uh, deal with riot situations and kidnappings and all that fun stuff, chemical warfare training. Um, and, uh, when I was at, eventually asked where I wanted to go, which is the, the, uh, first division of the Marines, um, or on an aircraft carrier, I said, <laughs> I'll take air conditioning and three meals a day. Thank you very much. And I'll get to live my top gun dreams. I've, I've, I've faced a gun before. I don't really want to do that again. You know, you realize, you know, no matter what your ideology is, how nice of a person you are, what you want to say. Bullets don't have a mind of their own. They hit whatever's in their way. And um, I have a tremendous admiration for war photographers. That being said, I know enough about myself to know that's not me. Now, you were on the USS Abraham Lincoln, an aircraft carrier. What was was the story with that? Um, That was amazing because Top Gun was my favorite movie. Uh I wanted to be a jet pilot my entire childhood. I owned every book, you know, on on all the old Mirages and F-15s, F-14s, you name it. Uh, and I got to photograph them on the deck uh, with these amazing aircraft. Now, this was for who? The New York Times still. The New York Times still, yep. okay. And they were taken off within five or ten feet from my head, you know, from the catapult or landing. And that was an amazing experience. The only negative was that uh, we were put, which is the positive was we were put in the Lincoln bedroom in the front of the, the ship uh, where all the VIPs go. The negative is that was di- my, my um, bunk was directly underneath catapult too. So every morning I would hear the steam at four or five in the at five or six in the morning going and bam, and literally every morning my head would hit the top of the bunk, and uh, it was an experience. But um, very interesting place to be on an aircraft carrier. It's probably the safest place in the world uh, because you're surrounded by you know so many ships and aircraft to protect you. Uh, at the same time, it's amazing how isolated you are from the war. Uh, because there's such a routine there where they, you, know, you don't think of what's going on, but you, then you watch CNN or Fox, whatever's on, and you see the bombs, you know, blowing up in Baghdad, and the planes land with fewer bombs, but no one's really making that connection. There's a total disconnect between the two. Which it's is you know, on purpose, you know. It's just, yeah. just your job. Let's not talk about any of that. You know, this is our job. Mm-hmm. You know, their targets and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, as a journalist, that was a very interesting thing for me to witness. Now, were you when you were in Pakistan? Were you doing any aerial photography there? Or, or no, 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 on the ground, uh, getting rocks thrown at us, you know, all that fun stuff. Because you did shoot Riots. from the air when you were on the carry. Correct. Yeah, they uh, they let us do uh, a flight in a, a Seahawk, and um, that was a lot of fun. Was but, this your first experience shooting from the air? Uh, I don't think so. No, not, no. At that point, I'd, I'd already done quite a bit for the New oh, York Times. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Uh, the best that, quote, though, from that was I was with a veteran pilot, 30 years plus, who said, you know what, kid, in 30 years, I've never had a chance to fly over the carrier during active operations. This is pretty cool. <laughs> and he had to ask the captain, and the captain said, sure, you know. It seems like you have a history of taking pilots to places they've never been before, eh? I do, I do. And I think, <laughs> you know, as long as it's safe, the idea is to do things that are different. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, that pilot would never have any reason to go up above an active carrier with F-18s taking off and landing beneath him. But suddenly when you have a New York Times photographer, the captain's going to say, yeah, sure, I want my ship to look good. And uh, it was made for a pretty beautiful image. If you've never photographed on an aircraft carrier, it's pretty amazing. It's like an air show every day. The flight deck's an extremely dangerous place. Lots of young sailors running around, operating aircraft, exhaust, intakes. But uh, photographically, it's one of the coolest places you can ever spend some time. We're going to take a short break. and we come back, we're going to talk about Air, the book. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. So the book itself was a, a return to still photography. Is that correct? Because you were doing Absolutely. commercial work and then you went into filmmaking. Exactly. So I, I, you know, I had a wonderful editorial career and then the 5D Mark II came out. And I was one of the first people to shoot 1080p video on a still camera. And that launched me into a new career uh, of, first of all, being a DP and then eventually a director uh, for short films and for lots of commercials. Did you see this as a goal early on or was well, this something that just sort of As I mentioned earlier, evolution. I'd always chosen between, you know, journalism or uh, film. And this was kind of that chance, you know, in my 30s to say, hey, it's right there in front of me. Let's go for it. And... Um, the irony is, you know, I stopped. I didn't stop. People stopped calling me. People like to pigeonhole you in this business. And they said, well, mm -hmm. he's a director now. He doesn't shoot stills. So I would do about one assignment a year um, with still video, uh, still photography. And it was always a mistake. Like, because like, I would be like, are you sure you, you trying to call me? <laughs> it's not like I lost any of the skills. So I was always flattered and always did it. Um, and uh, that's how AIR happened. It was a random assignment uh, from Men's Health Magazine. Uh, to shoot New York City, and uh, I asked them what what's what it's what's it about, and they said it's an article on the psychology of coincidence, and uh, that sounded really interesting. And I said, well, can I read the article? And they're like, oh, it's really long. I'm like, I can read. <laughs> I went to journalism. You're a school. photographer. You I went to journalism read. school. I can speak English goodly. The whole thing, you know. The pictures aren't in the article yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't read it. <laughs> so they let me read the article, and I found it absolutely fascinating. I had taken a, a cognitive science course at Northwestern uh, by mistake. Uh, you thought by mistake. Well, it, it, it was a reason. paying Here's off. Here's the yeah, reason but, why. Yeah, you you know, know, back in college days, I was like all with pre-meds. I was like, what have I done to myself? <laughs> uh, but I learned really fascinating things about the brain. And one of those things was brain synapses and how those works worked and or work. Hopefully they work. They're not working with me right now. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, I, I told the editor, I said, you know, wouldn't it be great to fly up at really high altitude and at night? And I think, you know, from flying in commercial aircraft that the streets will look like uh, brain synapses and or computer chips, you know, and motherboards. And they weren't really into it at first because they'd never seen it before. And it's expensive to do this stuff. And they're like, can you show us some examples of what this might look like? And I said, well, no, that's kind of the point. I don't think it's ever been done before. I'm like, what do you mean it's never been done before? I said, well, we've definitely flown at high altitude in helicopters during the daytime. But at nighttime, it's really, really rare because, first of all, we don't fly up that high that often. But definitely not at night because you can't see much. It's really dark. But the, the 1DX had just come out. And I said, you know, this is the time, the Canon 1DX that shoots at 32 or 6400, 6400 ISO mm -hmm. and produces clean images so, you know, I've been waiting to do, this, to do this since I was 16, you know, since I looked outside of a, of a plane every time I landed LaGuardia or JFK. It was a little bit of a struggle back and forth because they were worried that, you know, they didn't really know what it would look like. But they, they said, go ahead. And um, lo and behold, that led to an entire year's worth of work um, from that point on just by, again, taking that risk. And the coolest thing besides the fact that it was very cool and freezing uh, was that the pilot said, you know, I've never seen New York like this in my entire career. This was a 20 or 30 year veteran. And that's when I knew this was special. Not to mention, I could see stuff with my own eyes that I'd never seen before. What's a typical height for helicopter pilots flying over cities? In over general? cities in New York, it's 1,500 feet to 2,000, 25 sometimes, because uh, the building, for, you know, the Empire State's about 1,475 feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you're always, you know, over the Hudson at 1,000 or above and over the city at 1,500 or above. And you rarely go above 25 or 3,000 because they have different types of airspace for obviously fixed wing versus helicopters. So the, the funny part is throughout this assignment, whether it was New York or 
in Chicago or in Barcelona, we would request to go up at 75 or 12,000 feet. There would always be some big befuddlement <laughs> with the air traffic control on the other end going, come again? Did you add a zero? A long silence. Yeah, did you <laughs> add a zero to that? Are you okay? <laughs> you know, Are you having an aneurysm? Like, what are you doing? And uh, this was even though it had been cleared, like, you know, days in advance with, you know, the head of tra air traffic control. Uh, but uh, it was it was always kind of comical to hear that reactions. The, I, having flown at, in helicopters and photographed from helicopters up several thousand feet, I know that it's not always easy, but the challenges of shooting at ten to 12,000 feet really get complex. Can you describe some of the issues you had to deal with? Because it's not just a matter of opening up the door and sticking your camera out there. Well, first is the permissions issue, yep. um, especially in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, where, for example, the Berlin Senate had to write a letter of recommendation based on the previous work, saying we think this work is beautiful, we'd like to have you photograph Berlin. The other challenge is that not every city looks good from that high. You know, you'd have to have a city with a, th a lot of three-dimensionality. Uh, so Berlin was a challenge, for example. Did you um, have any cities that you wanted to shoot that you scratched from the list because they were just too boring? Not voluntarily. Uh, we wanted to shoot Paris, and we were given permission initially. Yeah. And that got scratched the day of. And we think because of security concerns. Interesting. Okay. Which was, you know, a killer because uh, I'm from France and it's a city of light. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. And I hope that we was get personal. A, that was personal. I hope we get a second chance. But anyway, we kept going. At uh, what point do you have this? Uh, well, first of all, I know that temperatures drop very yes. quickly as yeah. you start elevating. It could be 80 degrees down here. Yes. You go up to 1,000 feet and you're shivering. Yeah, I, I think Two every... Two degrees centigrade per 1,000 feet. There you go. Standard adiabatic lapse rate. There I you knew go. you'd know that. Exactly. Know. <laughs> <laughs> There's exactly. variations. There's de depends on where you are. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the truth is we were... I mean, I wore... I looked like a snowman. You know, I, I, I wore my Arcteryx shell and everything and, you know, sometimes two... Uh, long underwear um, and great boots. So it wasn't that bad. And I have great gloves that allow you to touch iPads and, or iPhones and stuff like that. So that wasn't that much of a challenge. Um, the challenge was the amount of time it takes you to get up there, you know, 15, 20 minutes, and how little time that gives you up there if you're, if you're planning on spending enough money for one hour or one hour and a half, plus the time it takes to come down, um, and um, how long it takes to move around up there. You know, it's you, you don't feel that movement. And not to mention the discovery. Uh, you've never seen any of these cities before. You can't study photographs from other people. Um, you can't go on Google Images. There's no frame of reference. Now, you did a certain amount of pre-planning, obviously, because you had a, there was just too much to cover in too short a time. And sometimes we have to fly uh, to, to file detailed flight plans, you know, weeks in advance. Uh, in Paris, it was literally point-to-point -point altitude. Um, and uh, we used Google Maps and Apple Maps, and we would look at the three-dimensionality of the city, especially in Barcelona, for example. So we did a lot of research. We cleared everything. And then the final hurdle was hypoxia. The first time I experienced that was in... Um, Could you define that for us? I know what it is, but there are probably basically a lot of people... basically dying. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> for lack of oxygen to the brain. It's a wonderful it's, word to describe yeah, it. Yeah, uh, I just experienced it in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. We went to 13,800 feet, and we got tunnel vision... Uh, we were all very tired and lazy. When you say we, does that mean the pilot also? No, we drove up this time. <laughs> oh, it was okay. actually more dangerous because <laughs> we drove up super fast straight up to the top of the mountain. Ah, okay. And uh, we were the most unmotivated people on the face of the earth. And uh, some of us felt ill and I literally felt like I had sunglasses on. But in the um, flight over Las Vegas, which was the first time we experienced it, uh, the pilot suddenly said, I, I feel a little weird. Um, and I'm like, well, yeah, I think we should go down a little bit. I'm like, that's a good idea because I could barely do ISO calculations, like 3,200 ISO, 64 ISO. I was like, whoa, too much for the brain. Um, and, uh, you just had to put it on program. Didn't they teach you I that? Shoot, I've shot everything on manual <laughs> since I was 18 with the exception of autofocus, without exception. Did in you the, have any uh, – I'm sorry. Okay, in the, just a point of reference, in the military – Helicopters are not allowed to operate over 10,000 feet without supplemental oxygen. And the other problem is, with altitude is the wings of the helicopter, the rotor system, likes thick air. And it gets and thin it get, up there. It gets very thin up there. So you're, you have a huge performance degradation the higher you go. Yep. It, it can turn into, depending on the aircraft, depending on what you're carrying, it can turn into a, uh, a challenge. Yeah, and then that was our first and last lesson. Every flight after that we had oxygen because um, – you know, it was uh, we we hadn't thought of it 
thought it through because Las Vegas is 2,001 feet above sea level. That's why we had to go to 12,000 for the first time. So in our mind, it was still only 10,000 AGL above ground level. But your lungs didn't agree and your brain no, didn't agree. No, of course agree. not. So we learned our lesson. And, you know, we were only up there for 30 minutes, but still it was enough. And uh, I had a bad hangover, like oxygen hangover after that flight. So... Now, this is obviously a still project. Did you shoot any video when you were up there? We did. We did some uh, with a partner called Nimia um, that uh, we shot over in New York uh, with a C500 uh, and a shot over. That looks uh, pretty beautiful. And uh, there was always this question with this project, is should it go into video? But the, uh, the amount of money involved is exponentially more expensive uh, than still. It's already extremely expensive. Uh, and still, we spent a lot of money on this project. I'm sure. And it was scary. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how many times did you go up in each of the seas? Was it a one-shot deal? I know you did a lot of pre-planning, but did you do multiple flights, uh, or is it were some of them just one shot? We tried to do a minimum of two flights per city. So cities like New York that are more accessible in my own backyard, I think we did a total of five flights. Mm -hmm. But uh, in London, it was two flights in one day. Um, and... Um, it's just so expensive. You know, be, the average helicopter is $1,700 to $2,700 an hour, depending on where you are in the world. And if you think about that, just imagine every minute pulling out 40 bucks and buying a round of drinks from all your friends. <laughs> every minute. <laughs> Interesting. Except in this case, you're throwing it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, there's this pressure that you have to not think about, you know, that's financial. And you're always at the mercy of the weather. Uh, London was a beautifully, perfectly blue sky to the point where the pilots were like, we've never seen the sky this blue. And I said, don't say that. And literally as we took off, the temperature fell and just on cue, almost, it was almost comical, the clouds pulled in over London and forced us to fly well below 12,000 feet. Uh, I think we were at 7,500 feet or something like that, maybe even 5,000. But, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's part of the deal. You know, it's just like, you know, adventure photography or aerial is weather is your number one X factor. It's what I explain to every client that hires me to do this. Is we'll have the best team. We'll have the best helicopter. We'll have the best cameras, the best lenses. We'll do the best planning. We will do everything we can to make this image perfect. The only thing I can't control is weather. Um, the book is primarily night. And we talk a lot about night and lights coming in from the city. However, you did revert to certain amount of sunrise and sunset images. Yeah. What caused you to do that? I had this hard and fast rule that said there's a lot of aerial photography out there. There's very little nighttime aerial, if any. This would be the first nighttime book. You, know, you think about Versailles in Paris back in the day. And then I, I just broke down. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw too many beautiful things at sunrise and sunset because we would fly at sunrise and sunset. Um, sunrise is not always the best because most of the building lights are off, whereas at sunset they're almost always on. Um, but sometimes the weather and other logistics just didn't permit you to have the, you know, the luxury of shooting just one. And at the end, towards the end, especially when you work on a project for one year, you see these amazing things. You're like, I'm going to sneak those into the book. And I think it was a good move because it gives it a little bit of variety in life. I mean, I think there may be a dozen images out of the 200 that are at daytime. So it's not that many, but it's enough to, to make you notice it. Actually, one of the strongest images for me was taken at the – it's over New York City, north end of Central Park. Yeah. And I believe – it's a sunrise shot. Yeah. And you're looking south. And yep. um, it's – the dynamics of it are absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And that was also one of the first shots that I noticed that the reservoir was frozen. I'm saying, this yep. guy was cold that morning. It was cold. The funniest things were we were periscoping from up, up there. So we were doing live periscoping. Uh, and people were seeing like New York from 11,000 feet, you know, and they were like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Uh, and it was kind of weird to be tra transmitting live, if you will, from your iPhone. <laughs> but, um, you yeah, know, there, there were some quite a few images from New York where it was either at sunset or um, at high altitude on, you know, on an overcast day that just showed you uh, what the city looks like. Notably, there's one lens, not to drop gear in here, but the Canon 1124 had just come out. And that I am not a fan of wide angle lenses. Um, I don't tend to want to shoot wider than 24 for the most part. But at 11, aerials are very different. Um, there's one image of the entire width of the city from, I'd say, the upper 90s or maybe the 100s all the way down to the southern tip of Manhattan, which would have been impossible years ago. 
um, or before this lens came out, and you'd have it looks like a field camera photograph, an eight by ten, and um, I I really like that lens for specific uses in aerial aerial photography. It's and it's wicked sharp. It's ridiculously sharp. It's probably one of the single sharpest wide angle lenses ever made by far. We're going to take a short break and we come back. We're going to go more into gear because taking pictures from flying aircraft, especially at night, is not easy. If you'd like to reach out to us with your questions or comments, email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. Todd, I'm going to let you pick Vincent's brain about gear and I'm going to jump in every once in a while. Tell us what you used to start with, and I'll have some follow-ups for you. Just look at the Canon brochure (laughs) 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 and pick everything from an 8 to 15 to about a 200 F2. Um, We brought one zoom lens or two, the 8 to 15 and the 11 to 24. But the reality is that could be used on very limited uh, circumstances because of their T-stop or F-stop at F4. Um, everything was shot with a prime lens. And I pride myself, you now know why, because of my dad, on um, framing things very precisely. You know, we used to throw away slides. We didn't crop it, crop slides. They were either perfectly framed or they were out. Without exception, maybe one image for design purposes in the entire book, everything is shot full frame on a prime lens. And that was part of the challenge for me because that's the ultimate ballet between the photographer and the pilot and to your traffic control is to not only get you in the right position, but in the right position at the right time with the right lens. It's an interesting point because I know from my shooting experience in the air, um, I always had fast primes with me, but quite often I would revert to zoom specifically because a lot was happening very quickly and I'd have to reframe for different purposes. I would never shoot with prime lenses from the air. It's, 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 it's silly. Uh, Things move very fast. Mm -hmm. You rarely get back to the same spot. And uh, people ask me, why did you do well in aerial photography? I think I said, I think it's because I did sports because you only have one touchdown. Good point. And same with aerial. You only get that moment once. It never happens twice. Yep. By the time you do the second pass, the light's a little bit different or the the moment's not there. So back to the gear. Um, Let's see. We brought an 8 to 15. We brought a 11 24. We brought a uh, 14. A twenty four one four, a thirty five one four, fifty one two, eighty five one two, one thirty five f two, two hundred f two. So you know, quite the cornucopia of lenses, if you will. Um, and the idea was that they were all primes. We all shot them either wide open or closed down one third or two thirds, depending on the optics, because at night, uh, this is a torture test for lenses, because especially on the edges, uh, you can see all the coma all right. the bokeh, all the issues of the lens because there's these little dots of light in the street. So uh, it was definitely a torture test. And the main camera used, I called it the king of the night, was the 1DX. Uh, that being said, when the 5DS and the 5DR came out, the resolution advantage was so noticeable, uh, especially on the gallery prints. We did some 60 by 40s, which is five foot wide. And you just, there's just, it's night and day. Um, And I I got to the point towards the middle to the end of the project when the 5DS came out that I would rather shoot stuff at a 30th of a second or a 15th um, and risk blur uh, than to shoot it on the 1DX with a low resolution uh, at 125th. Uh, We had gyros the entire time. I was going to ask you about that because yeah. image stabilization no way we could have done it without. doesn't happen. Yeah, there's no way we could have done it without. Uh, IS does not work from a helicopter. So we had two Canyon gyro labs, uh, uh, gyros, mounted our camera with, with some uh, really right stuff plates so it can quickly change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I should mention I flew with my assistant, Mike Iser, uh, who's been a friend and an assistant for a decade. And I don't fly without one because um, it's just too dangerous to swap lenses by yourself oh, yeah. uh, when you're in an open door. With cold hands. With cold yeah. hands and pins and that get stuck. And wind blowing and turbulence and so shaking. Also, you're, you're hooked into the helicopter. If yeah. anything goes wrong, someone's got to be able to let you out. Uh, and uh, so Mike was a, a big part of this. Uh, flown with him on every flight. I, I don't fly without him. I've flown once without him um, to do a promo shoot, and I felt you know sick to my stomach uh, for no good reason. And people do it every day. I just I am spoiled, I guess, but it's all about safety. Uh, well, you know, it's nice to be able to concentrate on your work and not about that stuff. That shouldn't be even on that your mind. That helps big time. You know, at the same time, you have to think about stuff even earlier. 
you know, so you have to communicate to the pilot and to Mike, I need a 24, you know, and on the second camera, once you've done that one, put a 100 or 135 F2. How many bodies were you carrying? Uh, three to four bodies. Okay. Uh, try to keep it to three. We had a fourth as a backup. Because as you know, there's limited space up there. They right. look big from the outside, but it's pretty small in there. And we had GoPros, and we had some BTS guys sometimes. So it got to be a bit of a circus. Um, but um, And we have to fly with these around the world too. Right. Know, they're heavy, they're expensive, and carnets and all that. So, But we just try to get the best lenses we could. The 200 F2 is a jewel when you can do it. You know, in Las Vegas, we compressed the entire city into one frame. Um, we shot the Golden Gate Bridge with a 200 F2 at, you know, uh, 12, whatever, 12,800 ASA, you know, at, at after sunset. So uh, we used everything. Because um, when you think about it, this is a fascinating thing to do once. It's a fascinating thing to do twice. But after two or three or four times, it gets more and more difficult with each, with each city. Not to mention that if you start off with New York City and San Francisco... <laughs> Yeah, it's not that you're going downhill, but it's more challenging because there just isn't as much three dimensionality to those cities. Uh, they're not as necessarily as iconic from the air. Uh, I definitely would like to do a second book um, where I go to Shanghai, where I go to Dubai, Hong Kong, Rio, uh, Mexico City, um, and smaller places like Amsterdam, and hopefully some African countries that may not have the development but have a whole different feel to them. Mm, I'm sure. Uh, I'd love to go to Iceland, for example. It's this beautiful island off of Iceland that has a little core of light in the middle of darkness uh, and a little bit of blue water, hopefully, around it if we shoot at the right time. So, you know, a second book is definitely something I'd love to do, but um, I, I, I may actually do a Kickstarter or something like that for the second book because the first book was 100% self-funded uh, with Real? the exception okay. of uh, a huge sponsor, Um um, G Tech and then Canon eventually jumped in as well. Uh, G Tech jumped in. Uh, they make great hard drives. We've, I've been a, a, an ambassador for them for years, and uh, they help sponsor Europe. And so it's it's. Uh, I'm not made of money, and this was definitely a passion project. This was not meant to be a book. If you had asked me two years ago if I would ever do a book, I'd have laughed in your face, because I was directing. I'm like, I'm not going to get to do a book. And it is kind of the antithesis of where you were going. It was really. ex <laughs> it was a total curveball, and I was I was planning on doing my first uh, feature film, and then this happened, and I was like, when the initial images were released, the reaction was very visceral. Uh, it was you know millions and millions of people very quickly. Uh, almost every single public publication in the world, numerous television appearances. And what I took from that was, you know, oh, great PR, which is, it helps. But it was more like, this is something special. You touched the pulse of I a lot of people. I touched the pulse of a lot of people. And, and more interestingly to me, not just photographers and geeks. It touched the pulse of doctors, lawyers, aunts, grandfathers. And that's when I knew it was special and something different. I know I've seen, I don't even know how many pictures I've looked at over there. And I, I've seen a lot of stuff that just makes me stop and just gawk. But this book, one after the other, the images are just really wonderful. One thing I want to get back to on, on the equipment is um, you use tilt-shift lenses to create that what we what they now call toy effect. We, and some of them are really wonderful. There's like one shot in particular, like I think it's a suburban shot. Of just, it, mm -hmm. just, it really looks great. Yep. And the one in London of... Um, What's the uh, Piccadilly Circus, is it? Yeah, Piccadilly Circus. That's wonderful. Yes. What I was wondering, though, the tilt shift you used basically the opposite of way it was really designed to do to get that fit. Did you ever use it the way it was meant to be to actually hold uh, uh, the depth of field no. a little bit more? I was just curious about I, that. I've done it for commercial jobs you know, since, but my first introduction to tilt shift photography was on an, a series of aerials for uh, the New York Magazine for a summer ish issue and I, one day I got bored and I put a tilt shift lens on the camera and discovered it. I'd never seen it before. Uh -huh. It had been done before, but I'd just never seen it. Right. So for me, it was a total chance. And I ended up doing for about two years, a series of aerials uh, with tilt shifts um, that were in the old Play Magazine and the New York Times and New York Magazine and Vanity Fair, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I've, it turns out I was one of two or three photographers that kind of helped revive tilt shift photography, unbeknownst to myself. The joke was I, I would call CPS at Canon and say, can I get some tilt shifts? And, yeah, sure. These things have been gathering dust. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then a month after the magazine article showed up, they're like, sorry, Vince, they're all out. 
And I was like, great. <laughs> and it's your fault. It's your right. fault, literally. Like people are ordering these things nonstop now. So um, I definitely don't claim to have invented it. Um, and I think maybe even re if reinventing is too big of a statement, but I know that we five one, interest two or three it. of us really mm -hmm. were one of the few people to kind of re bring it back. And then I knew it was all over when it became a picture style on the back of your camera. Oh, and I was like, Oh God, game over, <laughs> game over. Yeah. Time to do something new. How did you know which lenses to bring on each flight? Did you have a whole battery with you or did you have a, like visualize what, where you're going to be in relation to the city? And what we, to we did make some intelligent decisions on dropping one or two lenses on certain cities because we didn't think it would work. Not literally. Uh, <laughs> it's funny how to put that. <laughs> Not literally. Good point. Um, but um, we, what I found is almost every time you leave a lens behind, you regret it. Right. And um, <laughs> yeah. it's not like you can go back to your car or your drawer and pick that lens. You know, you've spent a lot of money to get up there. So we right. brought the kitchen sink almost every time. Gotcha. It all felt like it, it all fit in an insert. We had a, a um, those removable inserts from the Pelican cases. We right. just would pull that out and put that in the back of the helicopter. You know, obviously there's some cities where you were uh, dictated on where the aircraft was going to be yep. able to fly. Did you figure out the angles in that? Talk to the pilot, say like, this is what we're going to, this is what I'm going to be seeing through the camera. Yep. If we can go here, this would be great. Things like that. I, I've always just jumped in a helicopter before, prior to this and just yeah. gone up and see what I see. Whereas this, we would sit down, have a pre-flight briefing like I used to see on the Abraham Lincoln and right. draw on maps and make sure they were on the same page. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty calculated. And that's something I learned from directing is people like to be spontaneous, including myself, especially for a journalist. And what directing teaches you is to plan everything out and to plan on being spontaneous, meaning that if you've planned everything out and you have a plan, you have the confidence and you know what you're supposed to get, and when you see something better, you can make an a, a, a educated decision versus just going up there and saying, I, I don't know what I'm going to get. It's just too expensive. So a lot of planning went into this. It's, it's part of the unusual thing of this project. Um, and we'd have a checklist, like you got to get the Sangre Familia, you've got to get the egg, you got to get you know every one of these parts of Barcelona or London to make your series work. Um, you can't miss the Sydney Opera House in Sydney. It sounds obvious. Which is also a beautiful shot. <laughs> Thank you, but it sounds obvious, but there's like things happen where your, your brain's going a million miles an hour, and more importantly, the air traffic is telling you no because they've got Airbus A380s. They're literally rerouting around its little bug, this helicopter, because in Sydney, the, the planes take off straight towards downtown from the airport, and you're right in their way. So... We had a phenomenal pilot named Eamon in uh, Sydney who would bring brownies to air traffic control. She was very <laughs> friendly with them. And that's the only reason we got to fly over certain parts of Sydney. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. When I used to fly, it was difficult for me to tell my co-pilots where to put the helicopter to get certain shots. So what I in inevitably ended up doing was like, you can't, it's, it's difficult to tell them how you're framing the shot or whatever. So what I would do is I would fly the aircraft to where I needed it and I'd say, all right, you take the controls and don't move or something. But <laughs> yeah, I don't have that luxury. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 as a funny story about that, first of all, we try to fly with uh, either photographers who shoot mm -hmm. or who are in the motion picture industry. Right. Uh, there's a great pilot out of LA named Aaron Fitzgerald, who I've flown with for oh, eight years, nine years. He knows exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, he's extremely visual. So that's, that's just a walk in the ballpark. We love working with each other. Then we had pilots like, um, uh, George, I think it was, in Barcelona, who didn't speak much English. And um, we went through the whole fright, the pre-brief and everything. And I would ask him, could you, you know, right pedal a little bit and bank at 30 degrees um, at 10,000 feet? And he would go, okay. And then I said, can you, can you go left? And he would go, okay. <laughs> and we were still going right. And I said, can you go down? And he would go, can you go down by 1,000 feet? He's like, okay. <laughs> and Mike and I quickly realized he didn't speak understand anything we were saying <laughs> he was just saying okay to everything um so we managed to make it i spoke i speak spanish so i was you know a la izquierda, a la derecha, you know all this stuff and he's like oh okay <laughs> so we had that funny it's moment not, there it's not how it's not what you say it's how you say okay yeah <laughs> exactly and it was that was we still laughed at to this day because he really didn't understand anything we were saying and we still managed to get some good pictures so it was all right was there any other gear that you was key to the to the book to the that type of the night photos from the air. Um, I mean, the main ones, you know, the the gyros, the cameras, the lenses. Um, we never got to use grad NDs and stuff like that because we were yeah. at night. Um, the harnesses were key. Um, 
and obviously, you know, the data was important because you'd land with uh, 100 gigs plus of, of images. And uh, we were able, with some people want to go to my blog, blog.vincentlaferry.com, where I listed all of our workflow. We were actually able to re- review images with these GTEC drives and RAIDs that were fast enough in between flights so we can see what we got, what we didn't get, and make a decision with a one-hour break, which is pretty special. Right. That must have been a very intense hour, I'd imagine. Yeah, because you're reconfiguring the aircraft yep. and, you know, Mike's downloading the cards. We're doing a quick view through and speed is really of the essence. Speaking but, of speed. Yeah. Well, go I ahead. Had one more quick. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Were you shooting from a hover mostly or forward flight? Because uh, Hover has its disadvantages right. in that the helicopter tends to cavitate a little bit. Right. So we definitely did some of that. Um, but most of the time we were at least moving 10, 20, 30, 40 knots. Okay. Uh, and we try not to fly that much faster, but it was, you know, depending on the wind, it was almost always forward fly, but we always flew in twin, 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 uh, turbine helicopters. Right. Um, you know, I wouldn't do this in Robinson 22 or 44, right. uh, which is a single, uh, air uh, engine aircraft with so much power. Yeah. Been there, done that one. Yeah. yeah I, I did that for, for Katrina for a week. I flew over Katrina and Robinson 44, which I wouldn't recommend, but, um, you know, uh, that's all we had available to us. One question I had is that, and I thought it was really interesting, you're using cameras that are capable of shooting at extremely high ISO sensitivities, which would yeah. make sense for the kind of work you're doing. But in reading up on, on this project, you stuck to lower so base six, ISOs and slow shutter speeds and yep. shot in burst modes. Yep. And to get those few sharp images, I found that to be amazing. I've never been quality. I've never been more undisciplined in terms of uh, shooting high frame rates uh, on a still <laughs> camera. I, mean, I pride myself on doing a single shot. Uh, not this time. When the money's on line and it, you have weird things happen in the air where the exhaust comes from behind the helicopter in front of the lens and varies. And you see these really weird, like, why is the top of the image tack sharp, the middle's blurry, and the bottom sharp? Like, what? what's wrong with my lens? And you realize, oh, that's the exhaust with the wind coming from behind. Um, but, uh, yeah, we I motorized the heck out of this. That's why we shot so much data. It would take me on average for every two hours of flight, five or six or seven hours to edit because you have to shoot, edit it one, one to one to see how sharp everything is. And um, in terms of ISOs, you know, I always knew that besides the book, which is, you know, that's, it's really well printed. It's, it's some of the highest resolution printed. printing you'll yeah. find. We weren't going to get away with grainy images. And then I always wanted to do a gallery show. We just did a show in, at the Fahey Klein Gallery in, in L.A. And we made these beautiful 60 by 40s. And you really learned that, you know, going above 6400 ISO on a 1DX, you start to see too much noise. Because we're shooting in these dark cities where there's just no light. It's not a question of how well they perform. It's how well does your camera perform where there's total darkness. That's when the noise comes out. And the way we expose these was very important too, you know. Um, and... For the one, the 5DS, um, you can go to 32, but at 1600, it's pretty darn clean. So as the project went on, I actually found myself going backwards, where I was at a 20th or a 30th of a second or a 15th. Because I said to myself, I would rather have one image at sharp out of 20 or 30 at 1600 ISO on a 5DS than 10 of them sharp out of the 14 or 12 uh, at, a, at 21 megapixels. Are there any shots that you went out this way that didn't work out where you just couldn't get one image that was good enough? The one near heart attack, the first time in my career, was over Berlin. Berlin was just not working. They'd given us special permission. We couldn't go below 2,000 feet. It's an extremely flat city. And for an hour and a half, I was there with Mike saying, Mike, I'm just not seeing anything. And he's like, is it me? Is it Am I mentally off? He's like, I'm not seeing much either, Vince. So it was depressing. And we were had five minutes left. And I said, all right, let's go right up to 12,000 feet. And we put uh, a 5DS with, or I think it was 1DX, with a 8 to 15 on a monopod. Because the entire reason I went to Berlin uh, was for one picture. And that was to show that uh, 25 years after the wall came down, you can still see East and West Berlin based on the color of lighting. Mm. Um, and um, we got it. But that was at a 20th of a second at F4 at 64 ISO. And we shot 
hundreds of frames, and there were like two or three that were usable. Oof. And uh, we had no choice to go back up because the airport was closing. So if we didn't go back down, we, you know, we would get the helicopter stuck there, not to mention get, you know, the ire of the, the helicopter, the airport people. How did you white balance the images since you were shooting so many different color temperatures? Didn't bother. Shot everything on auto white balance. I okay. shot everything in raw and full manual mode and deal with that in post. Okay. Did You didn't adjust white balance in post or? Yes. So in post, uh, definitely went generally under, under 34 in the 2000 ranges so that okay. I can get more of the blue. Gotcha. A lot of these cities are extremely yellow. Yeah. What's your advice to the, we won't say the beginning photographer, but the, the novice pro who is going on their first aerial Please, please, please ask other people <laughs> what you should be doing. It or, is extremely dangerous uh, in terms of uh, making sure you're harnessed in properly, making sure the gear is harnessed into you, making sure you don't have any loose items. Uh, so often I used to invite lots of people up with me and the amount of times they've lost their iPhones, their sunglasses, these things become projectiles. Right. So now I actually do a pat down with people. Uh, I take their iPhones away. And um, you've got to understand that, you know, if you drop something from up there, it becomes a missile. Right. And um, I, I, I think you'll rarely find a fellow photographer who's experienced who will not share tips and tricks with you or pilots that are experienced with the aerial uh, because it's a liability. And, you know, that was one of our major rules on air is if we ever dropped anything, we knew it was over. Right. So um, we there's just no chances. And um, it's a pretty specialized thing. So I, I would definitely recommend you not go up at night at first. Uh, go up in the middle of the day where you can see everything and take your time um, and maybe stay away from large populated areas for a bit. But it's a fascinating thing to do. And, you know, frankly, I love shooting nature just as much as cities. So there's a lot to shoot out there. But um, the first piece of advice is find a helicopter pilot and uh, company that is that lists aerial photography, but more importantly, that lists motion picture experience because those are the guys that generally really know what they're doing. You know, anyone can say, hey, I do aerial photography, but doesn't take much. Whereas if you're doing motion picture stuff, you're at a certain level of experience that, you know, the gear is so expensive, you can't really fake that. Um, it's all about safety. And the conversation I have with every single pilot is safety first. I have two children. I have no in intent or interest in doing anything dangerous. If at any point you feel uncomfortable, let's just go back home and land or do something different. Um, and you've got to remember that a helicopter is 100,000 pieces of metal trying to sh shake themselves loose from one, one another with no aerodynamic properties whatsoever. I've heard it described as a machine that wants to crash. <laughs> That's accurate. It, it's, and, the, the, and before I worry everybody, which I'm trying to do because I don't want any more competition up there, um, <laughs> is uh, they actually have some of the same safest, if not uh, the Jet Ranger has the safest uh, record of any flying vehicle, uh, and I think even any vehicle, period. Um, it's in, with right pilots and in, intelligent ways of using it, you will be fine. But uh, actually, the biggest hazard is you dropping something from the helicopter. It's called a TFOA, for those who don't know, things falling off aircraft. It's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> the, <laughs> other thing, the other thing uh, Vincent alluded to is what they call FOD or foreign object damage, and that's lens caps, um, releases, anything, anything that you can drop, pens, pencils, can become, not only can they fall out of the aircraft, but they can get lodged into flight controls and cause a whole uh, assortment of issues. So Every single camera is, is hooked into me with carabiners. The yep. case is hooked into the helicopter with carabiners. There's no chance anything could fly out. That being said, we've had two circumstances where uh, we left the back uh, pillows, I guess, not pillows, um, seat, seat cushions. Seat seat cushions. Yeah. They're yeah. usually held in by Velcro. Right. And with the wrong gust of wind, those things fly out. And I've mm -hmm. had that happen to me twice. Once where I was the main guy and I don't know what the pilot was doing. And it went towards the, the rear rotor, which is not a good thing. And another one, we had a, an Instagram photographer with us. Ugh. And um, he Is there lost, such a thing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, he lost it. And I was just like, you know, really, seriously. So you got to be careful. Uh, things can't happen. And just that's why flying with experienced people. Um, is it's what it's all about. So what tips do you have aesthetically for the aerial photographer? I think the first thing I see people doing going up the, in the air is you're seeing this incredible vista in front of you. You're seeing this world in a way you've never seen it before. You can almost see the curvature of the earth at times. 
and you your natural instinct is to pick up a wide angle lens. And the problem is wide angle lenses very rarely translate into anything good in your photography. It's hard to right. get something strong in the foreground when you're up there's in nothing, several yeah, thousand there's, feet. Exactly, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. And you get this amazing image where you don't know where your focal point is. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which is part of the reason I use tilt shift, by the way, is to force that ah, that place to right. look at. You can also get rotor blades. Yes. And you get rotor blades, frame. exactly. Yes. Yeah. So what started my photography career, going back to the sports uh, background, is I used to shoot with a 500 millimeter. And I would shoot very specific small parts of the city uh, in a very geometrical, um, rectilinear way. So in other words, the next step is to look for geometry and pattern and color. So some of your strongest shots with those tighter ones, we have the buildings. They almost look like steps going around. A few of them mm -hmm. remind me of M.C. Escher prints with a stairway that just keeps going round and round. That's what you're looking it's for. It's beautiful, that You're, you're looking for that pattern that the architects saw. Yeah. But no one sees from the ground. That's correct. And whether it's in nature or in man-made cities. And, um, you know, have the discipline. I always say, when in doubt, shoot tight. Tight is always right. The other tip, which is for aerial photography but also for all photography, is I find that the reason I make my best photographs has less to do with what I'm shooting than what I'm not shooting. And what I mean by that is you'll see so many images that are good or okay, you have to have the discipline to say they're just good or okay or I've seen them before. You have to keep pushing yourself to find the images you've never seen before. Because if you're so busy shooting ones that are easy to get or that you've seen, you will never arrive at the amazing images you've never seen before because you've wasted your time on those others great piece of advice. Vincent, thank you so much for joining us today. Air is available at b and and everywhere. Give us your opinions on Twitter at BHPhotoVideo with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast and please rate and leave a review on iTunes. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, John and Jason, our engineer. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>